Hello. Today I will be beginning a new series of videos on a text called the Dhammapada. The Dhammapada is a group of 423 verses that are said to have been taught by the Lord Buddha at various times during his life. So, uh, it's generally considered to be a fairly good summary of the Buddha's teachings. And so I thought it would be uh, quite a good subject for um, videos spread in order to spread the Buddha's teaching and help more people to realize the benefits of, of, of the teaching. So what I'm going to do is uh, read you here, I've got the Pali verse, I'm going to read it in Pali, one verse at a time, and after the verse I will translate it piece by piece into English, give you an understanding of what it means. Uh, then I will tell the story which goes with the verse, uh, because each verse has a story that was passed down uh, uh, that gives the occasion and the circumstances in which the Buddha gave this uh, teaching. And after I give this sh sort of a sh short summary of the story, then I'll explain uh, how I think we should understand this verse and how it can uh, relate to our lives and to our practice. So one note about the stories is that uh, uh, th there's two two ways we can go. Some people will uh, pay more attention to the stories than the verses and remember the Dhammapada as a series of stories. Another group of people will never have heard or have read the stories and will therefore think of the Dhammapada as a group of verses. And I think uh, I'm going to try to hit a happy medium where we, we don't go to either extreme uh, because the verses have a great a benefit to them in providing a good example uh, of how the teachings can be applied and of how they apply to our lives. Uh, they pro provide us with encouragement when we hear about people practicing good things and uh, help us to adjust ourselves when we hear about you know, the, the results of bad things and so on. Uh, they help put it into context to some extent. Uh, the But what I'd like to say is that we should not let the stories uh, dictate the context of the verse because even though they do provide some context uh, the, it's clear that the Buddha was not uh, meaning to apply the verse only to the context in which it was taught. The teaching came as a result of, of a certain uh, event or, or, or occurrence in the Buddha's time is true but the, the, the teaching of course is much more broad and, and deep often than the circumstance uh, um, allows for. So, today I'm going to give the first verse, and this is of the Yamaka Vaga, which is the first group of verses. It's the Dhammapada, 423 verses, is um, uh, separated into different sections. So, this is the first verse of the first section. And the verse goes in Pali, Mano Pubangama Dhamma, Mano Setha Manomaya, Manasate Padutena, this is the Pali. The translation, Manopubangama Dhamma, uh, all Dhammas, Dhamma is all Dhammas, are preceded, Manopubanga means they're preceded by the mind. All, all things, all reality, everything is preceded by the mind. Mano setha manomaya, they are governed by the mind and made by the mind. Setha, mano setha, they are governed by the mind. Manomaya, they are made or formed by the mind. All things. This is the Buddhist uh, words. Manasa cepadutena, if with a impure mind, vasatiwa karotiwa, one acts or speaks. If one acts or speaks with an impure mind, Suffering follows therefrom, just as the wheel of the cart follows the ox that pulls it. So, if an ox is pulling a cart, the wheel has to follow the ox. There's no way that it can't. It can't stop. The It can't uh, change its course. It will have to follow after the foot. So, on the path, you will see the footprint of the ox, and you will see the footprint, the, the print of the of the cart following it always. 
because as long as the ox is pulling the cart. In the same way, when we act or speak, if our heart is impure, suffering will follow, just as the cart follows the ox, as the saying goes. So this verse was given in relation to the venerable uh, elder monk, Chakubala. Chakupala, Chaku means I, so Bala and Bala means guardian, so his name means one who guards his eye. And uh, this is a name he was given, his original name was actually Bala. But the story goes that he uh, became ordained under the Buddha a little bit later in life, and so he didn't uh, spend so much time studying. He stayed five years with the Buddha to do the basic training as a monk, but after that he asked permission to go off and practice in the forest with some of his fellow monks. And he spent three months of the rain season uh, in the forest and he made a determination not to do lying, not to lie down for three months. So he undertook this practice uh, to only do walking, standing and sitting. And so he would do walking meditation, he would do sitting meditation, he would do standing meditation, but he would never lie down, not for three months, no sleeping. So this means, unless he would sleep sitting up or nod off sitting up by, by accident. Uh, this is a, a, a practice that uh, monks will undertake when they've developed and, and uh, after they've, they've progressed in their meditation or become proficient and confident in their practice. So he did this for three months, and, and during this time he developed a, sickness, an, a disease of the eyes, a sickness in his eyes. And this doctor told him that he, would, he had to take this medicine, and he said he, had, he would have to lie down to take this medicine. Uh, something like put it in his, it was put in his nose or something, some uh, ancient Ayurvedic uh, um, cure. And... Now, Chakupala, he, he didn't say yes, he didn't say no, he took the medicine and he went home and he thought, went back to the monastery and he thought to himself, you know, what should I do? He said, well, I've, I've given this vow that I'm not going to lie down and, and I really want to, uh, to carry out my vow and to really exert myself in the practice. And so as a result, he sat up and he kind of took, took the medicine sitting up, but he didn't lie down. As a result, his sickness didn't get better, it in fact got worse. And he went back on alms round and the doctor came up to him and asked him, how is the sickness? Is it getting better? And he said, oh, and it's, uh, you know, the wind, is, the wind is still hurting my eyes. And he said, well, did you lie down to take the medicine? And he said, and he didn't say anything. He just stood there and the, man, the doctor said, sir, you have to take the, you have to lie down to take it. And he said, well, thank you. And he, he, he went away. And the doctor started to get suspicious and so he went back to the monastery, followed after the, the elder and uh, went and, and looked at his, his dwelling and saw that there was no bedding. And he said, Venerable Sir, where is your bed? And he said, and he didn't say anything. And he said, Venerable Sir, you can't do this. You, you're going to go blind if you do this. You have to take care of your eyes. You, you need them. If you want to be a monk, you're going to be... He gave him a little lecture. And the monk said, uh, Thank you, but I'll, I will know what to do by myself. I'll figure out what to do by myself. And so the doctor said, fine, but don't tell anyone, then, then you don't you tell anyone that I, I was the one who, who uh, cured you or who, who gave you the medicine. And don't tell them that I didn't want to have anything to do with you. And they said, yes, thank you. And so the doctor went away. So Chakupala or Pala, he, he sat down and he thought, and he said, well, then what do I do? I can either take care of my eyes or I can take care of my practice. I can either guard the, the physical body or I can guard the the truth. And he said to himself, My, if, I don't, if I don't take this medicine, if I don't take it properly, then I might lose my eyes, my eyes will be ruined. And he said, but these eyes, the, these eyes, these ears, this body, this self, this thing that I cling to, eventually it will all be ruined, it will all fall apart. He said, why, would, why should I base my life on the well-being of something physical? And he said, uh, I, it's much more important that I should guard the Dhamma, I should guard the truth, than, than that I should guard this physical body. And so he didn't lie down and he didn't take the medicine and he, he continued on with his practice. As a result of this, two things happened. First is he lost his eyes and the second is that he gained his eyes. And this is how the text goes, that 
as he was doing walking meditation, at the same moment, you know, his eyes got worse and worse and worse, and finally they, they, they deteriorated or, or something uh, changed, something switched, you know, switched off. His eyes suddenly became useless, his physical eyes. And at that same moment, as this was happening, and as he was watching it and worrying about it and looking at his worrying and looking at his clinging to the body and letting it go and, and seeing the suffering inherent in this clinging mind, you know, wanting and, and liking the fact that he can see in his eyes and, and you know, the self and the, and, and the ego and so on, seeing the su- where this, that this is the suffering. He saw the Four Noble Truths. He saw suffering and the, and the cause of suffering. And when he saw that, he let go and realized the cessation of suffering. So at the same moment, he, he saw the truth and he lost his vision forever. For, forever. His physical vision. He became an arahant at the same time. Uh, so at the end of the rain season, after his practice and after he helped out the rest of the other monks to, to become an, you know, to practice correctly as well, he made his way back to the Buddha and um, spent some time back at the Buddha at the monastery where the Buddha was staying, I believe in Sawati in in, in India, and in Jetavana, the, the the great monastery of the Buddha. And while he was there, of course, there were other monks taking care of him and men, him and, and monks who he would teach and, and they would look after him physically. And uh, many visiting monks. And, and his name got around as a fairly proficient teacher. People thought, that, you know, the, the rumor went that he was enlightened. And so monks would come to visit him. One day, one day, uh, one night, in the middle of the night he was doing walking meditation and he would do the walking meditation outside and it was raining, it had rained so it had rained heavily all night and then in the early morning, 3 a.m. or so on he got up to do walking meditation now at those times in India and even now in here in Sri Lanka, in Thailand they have these um, something like a termite or an ant that it's really the, the most useless animal in the world I don't know how it how they manage to survive because they die in the, in droves. They fly around and they lose their wings and then they just lie there and 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 and, and die. It seems like. And uh, this is what th- these insects were coming in the night. They come when it rains because I guess their their um, their layers get flooded, and so they were covering this walking path. And Chukupala came out in the morning after the rains on the 3 a.m. or so on, and started doing walking meditation. And as he was doing walking meditation, many of these insects died. As he was walking back and forth, he had no idea that they were there. And he, 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 they, they died, many, many of these insects were squashed. So in the morning, these monks came to, to see him, to meet him, and said, where is the Venerable Chakupala? This is the name he was given. Uh, and the monks who looked after him said, that's his monastery, that's his kuti over there. And so they went over to look, and they saw this walking path that was covered with his footprints stepping on on uh, these these termites or these ants or whatever they are. And these monks were were terribly offended, and they thought, "This isn't it. How can this be an enlightened monk who's here, uh, you know, engaging in wanton slaughter of these innocent creatures?" And so they were they were very offended, and they went to see the Buddha, and they said, uh, and they said, you know, this is this isn't right. This monk is he should be taught how to practice correctly. How can he be an elder and and still not know the correct, you know, the, 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 how wrong it is to kill? And this is where the Buddha gave this teaching, which actually becomes a part of a very famous uh, uh, or the, the very important part of the Buddha's teaching is the teaching the Buddha's teaching of karma, which actually denies the efficacy of karma. So people say the Buddha taught the theory of karma, and in fact, you can say the Buddha taught against the theory of karma, because the Buddha said, my son, Chakupala, is not guilty of anything, he's innocent. And then he said, Banupu Bangama Dhamma, the mind precedes all dhammas. The mind is what leads to uh, suffering. If you, act, if you act or speak with an impure mind, that's where suffering follows. So the Buddha took this verse, this verse was given in a negative context. The, the point was not to say that suffering is going to, in the positive sense of suffering, will lead to this. He was saying, 
if your mind doesn't have those things in it, then it, it can't lead to suffering. So it's, it's the, 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 the fact that karma cannot lead to unpleasant results. And this is an incredibly profound statement, I think, uh, because it's not something that we would think of ourselves. You know, if, if, you, if, if someone gets hurt because of something we do, then we think of ourselves as guilty. We feel bad, and if we don't feel bad, maybe the first person is angry at us, and they can get angry at us whether we meant to do it or not. But the point that the Buddha is making here uh, really shows the, the emphasis on the meditation practice, how the Buddha's teaching is really uh, a, a practice of, of meditation and of, of contemplation. Why? Because we don't understand things in terms of beings, in terms of, of uh, concepts, things that, that we think of. We think of that person and I hurt them and so on. We think of it in terms of actual reality and the experience. So maybe the person does get angry at me for something that I did. Maybe these monks got angry at Chakupala and, and therefore they think, oh, that was bad karma because it made people angry at him. But at the same time, you can say, well, Chakopala doesn't, it doesn't face him at all, really. He had no bad intentions towards the, the insects. He had no bad intentions towards these monks. And if they get angry at him, it's really water off, water off a duck's back, or, or it's, uh, like uh, the Buddha said, like, um, a mustard seed on a needle, or water on, off of a lotus leaf. You know, it doesn't stick. So, because his mind is pure, because his mind doesn't have any of this clinging, any of this anger. Whereas on the other hand, if he did have anger, if he did want to have bad intentions, and if he did intend to kill these insects, that is what would lead him to suffering. And that's what makes it unethical. An act is not unethical, as I've said before, simply because uh, it, it fits into a category, like if killing is unethical or so on. Killing is only unethical because of the mind states that are required to kill. In order to intentionally kill something, you have to give rise to a harmful and actually a perverted mind state, one that wants to, you know, doesn't want to die oneself and, the, and yet wants to cause harm to others. So the mind is of ultimate importance and this shows, as I said, shows the emphasis on meditation because it's only through meditation that we can affect the mind and, and mind is, uh, the mind is what is affected through meditation. As we practice meditation, we see the clinging, we see the craving, we see our uh, the stress that is caused by the impure mind, uh, and we come to differentiate, and we come to uh, eff affect a change on our minds. Um, when we see things as they are, when so we're doing walking meditation or we're doing sitting meditation, we start to, we learn to experience life in an interactive rather than a reactive way. So that when we see and we hear and we smell and we experience things, we're able to experience them as an experience. So someone yells at us, we experience it as a sound. Someone hits it, hits us, we experience it as a feeling. We don't think of the person, we don't cling, we don't hold on. And because we've seen the suffering, and this is what the Buddha was referring to, that the mind that clings, the mind that is impure, the mind that is, is stress, it has stress in it. This is what leads to suffering. Suffering only comes uh, from the mind. All of the, all of the things that we create, all of the things that we do, uh, the, the only have an influence on our minds if we cling to them, if we have some attachment in the mind at that moment. And this is a, a, a warning from the Buddha that anything that we do with an impure mind will have this, this influence on our lives and influence on our minds. It will lead to greater stress in our minds, greater clinging, greater suffering, just as the cart follows the, the foot of the ox. So this is the meaning of the verse. And the Buddha said, in fact, all things come from the mind. If you act with an impure mind, it will lead you to suffering. If you want to know where suffering comes from, this is where it and all other things come from, from the mind. And this is the first verse of the Dhammapada. So I'd like to thank you for tuning in, and I hope that uh, we will have many more of these, and I'll be able to get through all 423 verses um, before uh, my time is up. So thank you for tuning in again. I wish you all the best.